Thank you for waiting there. This is worth the wait because Billy Carson is a, is a fast rising star in this field, this field that combines archaeoastrology and astroanthropology. Just think about that. Just archaeoastronomy, astroarchaeology. This is the cutting edge paradigm. And people like Billy have studied both ancient civilization, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, and future ET civilization. So we get a combination of the past and the future, and we have it explained in a really intelligent, intellectual way. Because in order for us to really make a shift in the world out there, we have to bring these concepts back to a way we can understand them and explain them. So I'm very happy Billy Carson's here. Let's give Billy a big hand. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Can you hear me pretty good? Okay, great. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, I appreciate that. Um, as he stated, my name is Billy Carson. I'm excited to be here. I'm sweating, but it's not because I'm nervous, because I very rarely get nervous, to be honest with you. I'm just hot. <laughs> and I'm not taking off my jacket, because I'm on film. But um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I really appreciate you guys. We had a little technical difficulties, but we're going to get on our way. This is a little bit about my bio up here. As you know, you've probably seen me on Gaia, Deep Space, Ancient Civilizations. I've been on Buzzsaw. I've been on Beyond Belief. I've been on uh, George Norrie's uh, Coast to Coast AM three times. I've been on with Jimmy Church. I've been on a lot of you know, notable places, and I believe that they're contacting me to come on and, and talk about this stuff be is because I have some information that I'd like to share. They believe it's valid information for the general population, the general public. So without further ado, let's get started and get into this presentation. As you know, I'm the author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. It's a new book uh, that has just been released. It's only available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com with the number four, ForbiddenKnowledge.com right now. I do have some books available back here. If anybody wants one, I'll autograph the book for you and personalize it uh, after I get off the stage tonight. This is um, just a photo that I took when I just got back from Peru a few weeks ago. Um, I've been traveling all over the world. I've been around the world twice in 2018. 2018, I've been around the world twice. I made a dedication to myself. I've been traveling for a very long time. I mean, I went to Chichen Itza back 20 years ago, but I, I made a dedication to myself moving forward. This was back in 2017, that moving forward, I would get more hands-on in the field not just to be labeled as a researcher or a conspiracy theorist, or like I call myself a conspiracy realist, but a person that actually goes out and gets his hands dirty and gets out there and find out you know, for my own self what it feels like, what it smells like, what it tastes like. And so that's what I've been dedicated to. This is a picture that I just took um, just a few weeks ago, an amazing view at the top of Machu Picchu. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a tour of Peru in 2020 actually as well. I'll be announcing that probably online very soon. Just another photo, and I also proposed at that very spot. So if she would have said no, I was just going to roll right off the edge because, <laughs> hey, I mean, I can end it right there and nobody would you know, know any different. I mean, we're literally at the very edge. It's like a 250-meter drop right there. So I figured I'd just roll off and be, be done with myself. But luckily for me, she did say yes. So... That worked out. We're going to get married in that same spot as well. So we'll get married there probably when I do the tour of Peru. So everybody who comes to the tour of Peru will probably be at the wedding. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the fractal holographic universe. This is a photo that I took at the Field Museum in Chicago. And we're going to go into fractals. One of the things I like to do when I teach and, 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 and talk about these types of things in lectures and workshops, I like to use a lot of visual material because people I found are very visual and um, the majority of people are actually visual. And that's why Instagram has been such a big success. Instagram became a big success because it's very visual. It's mostly photos. I remember when it first came out and me myself was not really too much of a visual learner um, for whatever reason. But when, so when it first came out, I was doubting, I was like, Pictures? <laughs> I actually chuckled 
at the fact that just put, putting pictures online, I'm like, what are people going to put pictures of? How many pictures can you put up? Uh, and I said, one day I said, okay, let me just try this thing, because a lot of people started getting on Instagram like in 2011. So at the end of 2011, I said, let me make an Instagram account and post a couple of crazy photos and just see what happens. The next thing you know, uh, I turned into <laughs> something I couldn't even believe. Uh, you know, from 20, the beginning of uh, 2012 until now, 800,000, 801,000 now as of today on Instagram. Uh, Facebook started much later. It's around 600 and something thousand. But between all 130 accounts that I have, it's up to almost 3 million people uh, that follow all my different accounts. A lot of you are following other accounts, so you don't even know that I actually own those accounts. <laughs> That's a part of the fractal. <laughs> So what is a fractal exactly? A lot of people throw this term around, throw this term around a lot in the um, conscious community and in science as well and physics. Uh, and a lot of people utilize it themselves, but not really having a true in-depth understanding of what a fractal actually is. So I wanted to pull up the definition. A curve or geometric figure, each part of which has the same statistical character as a whole. Fractals are usual in modeling structures as eroded coastlines and snowflakes in which similar patterns recur progressively at smaller scales, and in describing partly random chaotic phenomena such as crystal growth, fluid turbulence, and galaxy formation. So you see why we're talking about fractals. Of course, the last term there, galaxy formation. The, the, I really do believe, and not just me, other physicists, scientists, really do believe that we're living in a fractal holographic universe, and I'm hoping that the information I present to you today will give you enough that you can go back and research for yourself and come up with your own understanding of it and maybe uh, you'll see it my way, maybe you won't. But I'm gonna give you the information nonetheless um, and uh, hopefully it does have an impact on you and you can see the perspective that we're talking about and it won't be so vague to you anymore. Could mere mathematics create an entire universe? What does broccoli have in common with the Big Bang? And what does it have to do with a video game like No Man's Sky or Minecraft? One thing. All are based on simple formulas that create infinite complexity. In 1980, the mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot publicized a simple formula. Z maps to Z square plus C. But you don't apply it only once. You take the result and feed it back into the formula. Do this often enough and a pattern emerges. The Mandelbrot set. The more you repeat this calculation, the more complex details are revealed. Ultimately, you could repeat this infinitely, the only limitation being the processing power of your computer. The patterns one can find here look strangely familiar and widespread. Mandelbrot gave them the name Fractals. Fractal patterns seem so familiar because these shapes are omnipresent in nature. The most important characteristic of fractals is their so-called self-similarity. Look at a fern leaf. It is made out of smaller and smaller copies of itself. The same is true for Romanesco broccoli. The branching patterns of trees follow this principle, as do the courses of rivers. Lightning spreads into smaller and smaller branches, each sharing the same features as the main bolt. But also man-made structures organize themselves into fractal patterns, without us actually planning them this way. Here is a map of all the roads leading to Rome and a map of the internet. It's especially fascinating that even your own body shows many fractal characteristics. Thanks to its fractal structure, your lungs have a surface area of over 100 square meters, enabling them to efficiently absorb oxygen. This oxygen is then transported through your fractal bloodstream into your brain, in which the neurons are interconnected Fractally, Every thought you think, even right now at this very moment, is a cascade of electric impulses traveling through the fractal network in your brain. This is a simulation of dark matter in our universe. The visible section is 10 million light years across. 
Even on these scales, you can find the same fractal branching patterns as in the neurons of your brain, in rivers, or in lightning. All this complexity is based on simple feedback processes and on formulas like the Mandelbrot set. With today's computers, we can take these fractal formulas and add a third dimension. With simple math, beautiful 3D worlds can be created. As it turns out, the easiest way to simulate a world as realistic as possible is to use fractal formulas. The first completely computer-generated movie scene in a feature film was the fractal animation of a planet in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Fascinating. The Lucasfilm group responsible for this was later acquired by Steve Jobs. From this, he created Pixar, thus revolutionizing Hollywood. Their animated movies look so realistic because the generated landscapes are based on the fractal principle of cell similarity. Progress has continued and today these elaborate and costly movie scenes have evolved into real-time walkable game worlds, like the landscapes of Minecraft. Their origin has not changed. Mathematical formulas that just need to be fed with variables. The most impressive simulation of an entire universe has now been created by a small team of 15 indie developers. The game No Man's Sky is probably the most complex and the largest game world ever created, and it fits on a single DVD. Every player starts exploring on a randomly chosen planet in the game's universe. The player's starting coordinates are the variable that is put into the game's sophisticated but still simple formulas. The result creates the whole visible game world in real time. It would be impossible to store all of the details using traditional methods. You would need entire data centers to store the data of the roughly 18 quintillion true-to-scale planets together with their unique ecosystems. It doesn't matter if it's a whole planet, a spaceship, a tree, a rock, or a single blade of grass. Every detail is the fractal result of a mathematical formula. So, one of the most realistic and complex simulation of our cosmos emerges from nothing but mere mathematics. And no matter where you look around in nature and our man-made reality, you encounter fractal patterns all over. Don't you think it's time to consider the possibility that fractals are a fundamental element of our cosmos? So as you see, if you really understand what was just said in this video, we are most likely living in a fractal holographic universe. We're going to get to the holographic part very shortly because I wanted to just really make sure everybody has a very good understanding of what a fractal actually is. And as you saw there as well, there's a small team of uh, scientists, young scientists in their 20s, who have now created their own uh, universe. And this is one of the topics to me that's very intriguing. The fact that we ourselves may be living in a holographic universe that is, as all ancient spiritual teachings and, and religious books have said, a created universe. The deeper you look into quantum physics and quantum mechanics, you really discover that we are living truly in a creation. There's a mathematical formula to this, and we're going to go deeper into some of the other math as well, and some supersymmetry in a few minutes, but we are really living in something that truly is created. Uh, and, and, and what happens, I think, with people is they begin to, when they think about a creation, they right away think of, of a God, usually a God-man, because they typically say he. It's always him, this, and he's capable, and he's going to bless me, and he, he, he. More of a masculine type of a driven type of a mindset uh, for creation. But I really think that the energy that creates this entire universe is more on the feminine side, a feminine energy, the Sophia energies that actually emanate from the womb, which we're going to show you as well in a little bit. But I want you to get a good understanding of fractals. So we're going to continue a little bit on fractals. 
Here's me again at the Field Museum, and here's a fractal. Has anybody here ever heard of Donnie Arcade? A few people heard of Donnie Arcade, okay. I own a record label named Pantheon Elite Records, and I have a conscious uh, rapper. And uh, this is a, a song he did to this fractal pattern that we have here. Just check out this fractal pattern. Watch how deep it goes. This was a simple one-minute pattern. Remember the no one is Apollo. In the darkness, I gave light to him. Healed their wicked hearts. Rays go right through them. Can't blame them. Their frequency influence. Made by entities who want to see cities in ruins. You can feel it like Phil Collins there in the night. So much tension. Katana blades give it a slice. The wind's cold. It's humbling. I'm living my life. But they don't know I got the power of 10 poltergeist. Why you defenseless? 11-11 sequences. Keep me all on track like GPSs. More blessings. Yeah, more blessings. Yes, this the essence. Yes, you feel the presence. Superior intelligence. Lying on my melanin. When they know it's heaven sent. Preaching about where they never went. Dimensions they ain't never been. Huh. Who you think you are? Looking down upon. I swear to God, you the furthest from God. Lower vibrations. Further from where we are. I'm feeling like I'm in Mount Olympus with Thunder Rods. Zeus. That was a lot of data stored in a one minute fractal pattern video. If that was on a conventional type of a data storage, we probably would have needed enough hard drives to fill up this entire stage. So you see with fractals, you can get a complex amount of information and data and a complex amount of, in our, in our case, biological life forms, uh, planets, stars, galaxies, and solar systems, all out of one very small, very simple fractal uh, ge geometric uh, equation. So this is why fractals are very important. When you truly understand it, and shift your mind from thinking a magic guy in the sky with a magic wand is like making planets. <laughs> if, you, if you shift your mind out of that, it doesn't take away from the fact that this entire realm is spiritual because the actual consciousness is a spiritual energy that's filled up this entire third dimension. Uh, and that's what we access and we tap into. But what I'm trying to tell you is that behind the scenes, up above these dimensions, there potentially is a creator or creators of this realm that used this mathematical pattern that we have simply only rediscovered. Let's hear a little bit from um, Nassim Haramain. Just a couple of minutes here. Yeah, the and Bruce Lipton as well. The structure of nature is designed on the basis of what is called fractal geometry. And fractal geometry is unique geometry, not the one we learn in school. The geometry we did learn in school called Euclidean geometry, you can't model nature with it. it does, all those triangles, cones, cubes, and spheres are not what nature really looks like. But in, when we were five years old, in kindergarten, we made a tree. We made a Euclidean tree. We had like a, a cylinder for the trunk and a ball for the top. But obviously that's not nature-like. That geometry is not the nature geometry. We now recognize this new geometry that really came into our world in 1983 with the work of Benoit Mendelbrot from IBM called fractal geometry and it's a different version of geometry and it's very exciting but here's the fundamental key characteristic of this geometry built into the nature of the mathematics is a reality that images of the structure repeat themselves in a very self-similar fashion at any level of the organization that you're talking about so if you want to talk about cells or people or civilizations they're all built on the same geometry but the key word for most people to understand is that this geometry links an ancient mystical understanding uh, there was a phrase that uh, people are familiar with as above so below well, in this new geometry, that becomes mathematical and scientific as a reality. Every atom is a mini black hole, that it has infinite density, that it has infinite potential, that everything has singularity at its center. Um, the vacuum energy, the structure of the vacuum itself, uh, interlinked or entangles all protons, that the proton being the nuclei of an atom, that all the nuclei of atoms are entangled because of the structure of the vacuum, that the structure, that, that the vacuum is not a passive vacuum, but an active vacuum that has a role to play in the creation of the, our, our material world, but as well is the structure that connects all things. So actually this is a mathematical rendering 
of the concept everything is one so that it actually is uh, mathematically proven. That's why I can study the nature of a cell and understand the nature of a human because a human is a fractal image of a cell. We, we're made out of cells, we're just a, a large version of a cell. And so that a human body turns out not to be a one thing as we see it in the mirror, but when we really understand, if you could see it with microscopic eyes so you could see what it looked like, you recognize that a human body is a community of upwards to 50 trillion cells. Every cell is essentially a miniature human because virtually every cell has every function that I have in my body, it's already present. As a matter of fact, any function that I do with my body is only because a cell can do that function because I'm made out of cells. Well, I think that um, the world of physics and the world in general is transforming and that there's an opening that's occurring and certainly in physics, um, you know, there's a level of arrogance that's slowly uh, fading away, you know, not so long ago when I started in uh, bringing my work to the physics community some 15 to 20 years ago. The tendency was to think we've got the universe pretty well all figured and all we need is a few little things to work out and then we've ha we have it. And so there was a lot of um, you know, arrogance in the way, you know, physicists were interacting with new ideas and so on. And so it was extremely difficult to be heard. But uh, since then, a lot of failures in our theories have come forward, a lot of experiments in laboratory and, you know, data from cosmological instruments and so on have shown us that there's anomalies that we cannot explain with the standard model and all sorts of things are coming up and so uh, you know a certain level of failure of string theory and so on and I think that uh, it's, uh, it's changed the world of physics. The same responses of cells to their world are exact. I want to pause right here for a minute because they're kind of going to go over a little redundant, and I want to move on a little bit because we got a late the start. Geometry, but the structure one of, the, of nature is designed on this. One of the important things that um, Nassim Haramein said was that the protons are entangled. Have anybody here heard of quantum entanglement before? Okay. Quantum entanglement is very important. It's a very powerful thing. It links us to the spiritual world. The reason why prayers work, if you know how to pray, and that's a very important thing I talk about a lot of my, <laughs> at a lot of my seminars, you have to know how to pray because there's two different ways to pray. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about it here as well. But you must quantum entangle with the source energy. And when you quantum entangle with the source energy, that's when you can get a result. If you're praying at the wrong frequency, in other words, if you're praying from a position of begging, uh, you know, from a position of being on your knees, which is not a problem being on your knees, but you're in the position of, I need help and I don't know where I'm going to get it, and I'm asking and begging for something, a result, versus using the power that's already in you of the creation and commanding your end result, commanding I'm healed, commanding that this is, situation is going to get taken care of, commanding that everything is going to work out in my favor, not commanding as if I'm the creator of all planets and moons and solar systems and everything else, but commanding knowing that the source energy runs through you, in you, and out of you, and understanding that all of that is on the inside, and then you can push it to alter your reality tunnel on the outside. And in science, in quantum physics, you can quantum entangle atoms by simply phase shifting the atomic frequency to the same frequency. So if I take, if I do parabolic down conversion with a laser and take two particles of matter and get them on the same frequency, I can take one of those particles to the other end of the universe. And then when I change the information or put data on the one that's local to me, the other one that's on the other end of the universe will change instantaneously to match. Okay, so that's incredible. That bypasses the speed of light. So what does that tell you? Distance is an illusion. Space is an illusion. Time is an illusion. Locality is an illusion. The fact that I'm standing up here now talking to you, I'm actually talking to myself. <laughs> and vice versa, when you're talking to somebody, you're talking to yourself. We're all different aspects of the same exact consciousness. That's all we are. We're literally, consciousness divided itself into multi-Googles of entities to experience itself subjectively from various different perspectives on a data collection mission. Consciousness is here to collect information. That's what this whole experiment is all about. And what do I mean by that? 
Let's go into fractal mode and go down as above, so below. Let's look at your brain. Okay, your brain is encased in complete darkness. And what does it do? It doesn't know what's going on out there. It can't see, smell, touch, feel anything. It says to its friends, please, you guys go out there and collect some data. Bring me back some information so I can figure out what's going on out there. So sight, smell, hearing, feeling, touch, and everything, they go out, they go, okay, we're going to go out and collect this information for you. But they themselves don't know what the data is. They can't decipher it for themselves. They have no idea what they've collected. They've just collected literal zeros and ones of bits of information. They bring it back to the brain that's encased in complete darkness, and then what happens? The brain puts it all together, figures it all out, and then projects a hologram of what's going on on the outside. And you navigate through an electromagnetic field to bring you even here to this uh, seminar today. That's how it works. And when you quantum entangle, when, you, when he's talking about, and I see him here, when he's talking about quantum entanglement, it lets you know that everything is connected. We're all connected. If you energetically, all of our particles, all the atoms that make up our bodies are all still connected. We still literally are all one. Separation is an illusion. The only thing that gives you the illusion of matter and separation is when you slow down the frequency of an electromagnetic wave and it then add consciousness and a conscious observer, then you can break it down into or collapse into a pattern that can be recognized as physical matter. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about um, a creation that we're living in that uh, luckily for us is not 100% static. It's, it's dynamic. And when you know how to, nav I call it navigating through the matrix. That's what I call it. When you know how to play in the matrix, your life will become a lot easier. A lot more things, the law of attraction will work a lot easier for you. Your prayers and meditations will, will blossom and bloom more. Uh, you know, your desires will come forth a lot better, a lot easier. But it's all, it all starts with understanding, first of all, what are we living in? What, what are we actually a part of here? And I think that once you get a good understanding of that, a lot more stuff will open up for you. And some people will call this new age information, and I, don't, I think it's ancient information, which is why I wrote the book, The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. So I go deep into how to manifest light, uh, how to manifest uh, matter from light particles, which Thoth talks about 36,000 years ago, how to use fro vocal frequencies from your own throat to alter your reality tunnel. That's in the Emerald Tablets as well. I break all this down. Uh, some people thought that he was calling on names of people. No, he's calling on frequencies. He's emitting or emoting frequencies from his vocal cords that actually have a direct effect, when you say those words the proper way, on space-time, the ether of space-time itself. So I go into all of this, and some people go, well, what are the animal tablets? So I just want to give you a quick breakdown, because this is the fundamental basis of a lot of my research, to be honest with you. The history of the animal tablets is strong and well-documented. The original text was written in Thos Atlantean language. The version I'm referencing right now is basically... Um, from Dr. Doriel, who uh, you can find his, um, his, his, his actual uh, uh, interpretation on crystallinks.com. A new translation has been published from the Arabic version of the Emerald Tablets, and it's called The Book of Causes, written by the famous Thomas Aquinas. A lot of people who uh, maybe have followed the Catholic Church know Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a translation by Sir Isaac Newton. You might have heard of this guy before. <laughs> uh, Sir Isaac Newton, his... Um, his work is currently housed at the King's College Library at Cambridge University. So his translation, interpretation of the Emerald Tablets are, at, uh, are in England. You can, you can actually go there and look at them. Philip of Tripoli also translated the Emerald Tablets in 1240 AD. A famous version of the Book of Secret of Creation and the Art of Nature was written in 683 AD, AD by him, which was also inspired by the Emerald Tablets. A famous author named Roger Bacon was accepted into Oxford University at the age of 13, also translated and wrote a version of the Emerald Tablets he was an English philosopher, Franciscan friar, who placed considerable emphasis on the study of nature through empirical methods. And in, in the early modern era, he was regarded as a wizard and particularly famed for the story of his mechanical, neurocratic brazen head that he created. He, uh, he's sometimes credited mainly in the 19th century as one of the earliest European advocates of the modern scientific method, which inspired Aristotle and by later scholars such as Arab scientist Al-Hazen. And also now in 2018, a brilliant man, you might have heard of him, Billy Carson, was also inspired to write a compendium of the Emerald Tablets. Okay, so you might, you might have heard of that guy. <laughs> but this information goes back 36,000 plus years. That's how old this information is. And when you tap into the Emerald Tablets and start reading it, you start realizing right away, if you read the book, you'll see it syncs up with a lot of the religious books that are really more new age, modern, like uh, the Bible, the Quran, 
uh, you know, all these modern religious books have taken information directly from the Emerald Tablets. And I mean almost word for word. It's uh, when you start, when I start lining up those uh, scriptures to something written 36,000 years, you have, to, you have to say to yourself, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, this stuff is really old, and you start to realize that a lot of this information was literally hand-picked directly out of these, of these tablets. And then when you look in the Old Testament of uh, the Bible and some of these other texts, you discover that um, that information came from the Sumerian tablets, which are publicly available. And you don't need Zechariah Sushin to decipher the Sumerian tablets. The Sumerian tablets have been deciphered hundreds of years before Zechariah Sitchin was even a, a born, before he was even an embryo or whatever you want to call it, a spermatozoa. Uh, that thing has been floating around. Oh, he's the only person that can decipher it. No. What Zechariah Sitchin did was he took uh, information from the tablets that were already deciphered hundreds of years before he was born, and he took information from the Bible, from the Quran, and from other religious texts, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, and what he did was he painted a picture. He tried to piece it all together and give us an, an idea of what may have happened. Uh, and and um, I, I think that his work's been venerated because a lot of independent scholars have now gone into the tablets, including myself, and have come up with the same concept. Now, the story may be slightly different here or there, some of the particulars, but the overall idea that these advanced beings came here in ancient times and uh, they didn't create a human being from scratch, like just, oh, poof, we're going to make a human out of dirt and do some chemical, alchemical stuff. But what I personally believe is that they came here and an existing hominid was already on this planet evolving, uh, not the typical evolution of, you know, the science, mainstream science, but we were here already and probably most likely a lot smarter and more intelligent than we are now. I'm dead serious. I'm not talking technologically smarter, maybe not in that time frame that they arrived, because there has been four advanced humanoid civilizations on this planet before the Anunnaki even got here. They came at a time when we were down. We had uh, fallen again through the cycle of the yugas. Civilizations rise and civilizations fall. That's just the cycle of life. There's nothing you can do. It's a very cyclical, cyclical thing. And when they arrived, there was an existing hominid here who was attached to this planet more spiritually, more in tune with the human resonance and frequency of the planet. We all still have millions of magnetite crystals in our brains right now and we don't even use them. Well, not all of us. Some of us here are using them. But a lot of people don't use them to navigate the planet, to detect uh, situations that are occurring. For example, if, you're, if there's a, um, a tsunami coming inland, wild animals get away from the coastline hours, sometimes days before it occurs. How come they know and we don't know? We stay there and we swim, we're swimming in the ocean and we get swallowed right up. But all the wild animals head up to the mountains. They're in tune with the earth, they're in tune with the planet. And I believe that based on the skull size of some of our ancestors that were here, they weren't called homo sapiens at that time. They were various different humanoids. Uh, and uh, to me, in my personal opinion, after looking into the research and looking into some of the archeological sites, they were way more advanced than us. Their pineal gland was larger. They were spiritually in tune. Uh, they most likely had psychic capabilities, could communicate without moving their mouths and everything else, maybe even telekinesis, a lot of other various gifts that we are here are now all just starting to rediscover how to download information. And uh, real quick, I want to talk about that because a lot of people use the word we download, we're down, get downloads. Never be afraid to use that because let me tell you something, the human DNA is very powerful. It's also a fractal pattern. But one of the most interesting things I found out about the human DNA is that one gram of DNA, that's enough to put on the tip of your finger, can store 700 terabytes of data. 700 terabytes on one gram. A human body can literally store all the information from the beginning of time until this day. One human body. You're literally walking around in a gigantic storage unit of data that's already inside of you. And when you look at what happened when these beings came here, they disconnected that. So it wasn't that they created a, uh, a dumbed down version. What they did was they started disconnecting our information and made us into homo sapiens. Our brains got smaller, our pineal glands shrank, and we have all this junk DNA that used to be connected. Now, one thing they discovered about the DNA is that you can actually download digital bits of information directly onto DNA. Zeros and ones, like I can connect it into a microchip, put it into a computer, and I can upload and download files, videos, play this whole presentation on DNA. Think about that. This is being done in universities all over the country. So they, they, I think they downloaded the whole Library of Congress onto, onto the DNA and, put it, and uploaded it back to the server. Now they discovered as well that, well, we here already knew, that everybody emits a frequency. 
That frequency is emanating out and in, upload, download from DNA. So when you say you're getting a download, you're really getting a download. Your, your body, if it's in tune to the right frequency, will download information directly into the DNA, and now they found out that memories are stored also in DNA. So you can download information, digital bits of information, into your DNA, and they can then be sent to the brain for processing, and you can get uh, spiritual contact, you can see other, into other dimensions, you can get deeper into meditations, you can uh, get in better, higher levels of intuition. All these things are very capable and possible and are not... Uh, freakish, mystical, you know, things that shouldn't be happening to human beings. These things should be happening all the time and on a daily basis. This should be a normal part of our lives. Right now, the people that are in these positions of being able to tap into these frequencies and gather information are considered, you know, superheroes, in my personal opinion. Uh, so, uh, but eventually, as we continue to move back towards that golden age, a lot more people will be able to tap into these abilities as well. Thoth built uh, the Great Pyramid. This is in the Emerald Tablets. His exact words, I built the Great Pyramid, patterned after the Pyramid of Earth's force, burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. In it, I built my knowledge of magic science. Magic science translates into advanced technology. So that I may be here when I, again when I return from Amenti. I, while I sleep in the halls of Amenti, my soul roaming free will incarnate, dwell amongst men in one form or another. Hermes the thrice born. And one thing that, uh, if you've seen some of my other talks, I talk about um, these halls of Amenti, which were now discovered underneath the Great Pyramid at Giza, where Thoth would go down for 100 years at a time, and he had been down there 100 times by the time he wrote these tablets. So that's 100,000 years he has spent in regeneration chambers. Yeah, which have now been discovered underneath, and they're covered in, de in depth in the book and sort of photos and everything, underneath the Great Pyramid. Um, hundreds of, uh, of these um, rooms that are down there where most likely they had these regeneration chambers that he would utilize. And he would transfer his consciousness from one avatar body to another, which we're now doing ourselves. You look at DARPA. DARPA has the Avatar Project. Successfully already has now transferred a human soldier consciousness that's in a concrete room, probably in a bunker somewhere, into a field robot halfway around the world or in some test facility, this is documented real science. It's already been admitted. This isn't like a conspiracy. This is real stuff. You can look it up. So we're now, just like the movie, the consciousness of the, of the, of the soldier is inside of this robotic body. If you look at uh, the 2045 project with Russia, they are now at the point where they've already transferred the consciousness of a monkey into a computer. And the monkey thinks it's alive. It's eating bananas. It's climbing trees. It's running around. The monkey is dead. Well, physically, in, in this realm, it's dead, but it's living inside of a computer. That's how easily the mind is fooled. And when you start looking at these virtual reality games and how high tech they're getting, you, you can understand that why some people are getting heart attacks from being inside of virtual reality. Uh, people have had strokes being inside of virtual reality because that's how good it is. It fools the brain into thinking that you're really there. And if it's a scary scenario where it's a, some kind of a roller coaster or whatever and you get scared, you can literally have a heart attack or a stroke. But the reason why I brought this up is because pyramids are a very big part of the fractal pattern that we live in. This is a very short video. It's going to just demonstrate to you fractal patterning of a pyramid. Now, when I went to, I've been all over the world. Every pyramid complex I've been to, the, there are multiple pyramids inside of the pyramid, built into the structure. All pyramid design, well, at least the ones that I've been to, have been fractally designed from the inside out. As you continue to feed back the pattern directly into itself, you can get an unlimited amount of these fractal patterns without increasing the volume of space. So inside of this pattern, you can go almost infinite with the fractal patternization without actually having to make the triangle any bigger. That's what's so amazing about fractals. Like I said, I've been all over the world. This is a video of me at Teotihuacan in Mexico. This is the Pyramid of the Sun behind me. This pyramid is built of multiple pyramidal structures on the internal part of it. 
So inside this pyramid, are, it's, a, it's, a, it's built based on a fractal pattern design. And like I said, most of the pyramids around the world are all built on this fractal pattern type of a design where there's pyramids inside of pyramids inside of pyramids until you get to the outer structure. Uh, there's also the pyramid of the moon there. That as well is uh, a multi-pyramid a multi pyramid design. So when you look at the internal structure, it's pyramids on top of pyramids, and it's built again in a, in a fractal pattern. This is me at Giza, at the Great Pyramid. Again, this pyramid, I've been around it, inside of it, on top of it. <laughs> uh, this is one of the most amazing pyramids in the world, and it's, it's called the Great Pyramid for a reason. It has so many astrological and numerological, numerological uh, uh, features in it. It is just mind-blowing and outstanding. You can calculate everything with the Great Pyramid. You can calculate the speed of the Earth around the sun. You can calculate the distance to the moon. You can calculate the distance to the sun. You can calculate the tropical year, the sidereal year. Uh, this is all based off the pyramid um, uh, blocks and the uh, geometric shape and, and the, uh, the feet that it has on the base as well as the height at the top. The height of the Great Pyramid will give you the average land height of all the land mass in the entire world. How do you get that information? That means you have to be in something above the land that scans all of the land mass and it has to take that information into consideration and it has to come up with an average number. When it comes up with that average number of land mass, then you say, okay, we're gonna build the Great Pyramid to that average land mass height so that somebody in the future can discover how technologically advanced this is or key in on some of these mysteries that we have hidden here. This is a, should be like a beacon to say, hey, there's more knowledge than this in here. So when I looked into it, the Great Pyramid is 455 feet high, and that's the average land mass of all the, ma all the land on Earth. It's also built directly in the center of the land mass of Earth, not in the center of the Earth. It's built in the center of the land mass. So again, you would have to be able to scan the entire planet and find out where would the central location for all land mass on this planet be located, and boom, right there. When you look at the Perry Reese map, which is an ancient map that dates back and has been reproduced many, many times over and over, over lambskin and everything else. This ancient map depicts Antarctica without the ice, exactly as it would look if the ice was removed. Uh, the other thing that's amazing about this is that um, it's, it's written in a certain type of an angle on the parchment, and that angle could only be viewed from space looking directly down on Cairo, that perspective of the map. So again, we have another hint that uh, these people may have been, our cousins may have been space travelers. This is me inside the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. Uh, inside the king's chamber, these gigantic magnetic granite plates are uh, 100 tons, and behind them are fractal uh, pyramids behind these uh, gigantic uh, uh, granite plates. And I'm standing right there with what they call the sarcophagus, which is not a sarcophagus at all. It actually, it, it's actually the same exact dimensions of the... Um, the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant most likely used to fit directly in that box. That box was added to the structure much later because the pyramid was a power generator, a power generator amongst other things. This is just one of the features that it was, uh, was a power generator, but it also did a lot of, it transmitted information, it transmitted sound frequencies, it transmitted, in my personal opinion, even images. It probably opened up portals. Uh, it had a lot of functions and features to it. If you look at the location of the uh, geometric coordinate for the, for the Grand Gallery, not the Great Pyramid, but the Grand Gallery itself. It's located at 29.9792458. Look at the speed of light in a vacuum, 299,792,458. So you see that, that's meters per second, by the way. So you go, wait a minute, meters weren't invented until, or discovered until the 1960s or whatever, no. When you go into the Sumerian tablets, you start to learn a lot of information about our ancient history they had a metric system, a proto-Sumerian metric system, which is even on Wikipedia, believe it or not, which I don't really go for Wikipedia, but the fact that they even documented it, but it gave me some links to some valid sources, which I was able to check out, and to some actual tablets that had the metric system written on them 7,000 years ago. So forget what you learned in school about we just started getting the metric system. That's all brand new. It's all new age stuff. The metric system is ancient, okay? Very ancient. This is me at Chichen Itza. This pyramid, again, at Chichen Itza is uh, a fractal pyramid on the internal parts of this pyramid are multiple pyramids. Tulum, as well, multiple pyramids here, okay, inside of this structure. Uh, when I tell you guys I've been all over the world, I'm just telling you I've been everywhere investigating this stuff, getting my hands on it. 
So no matter where you go around the world, you're going to find pyramids all over the world. And the structures are all built on these nodes, these magnetic nodes or these power nodes of the Earth. And when you look at those power nodes of the Earth, you discover something. They're even fractal. So the planet's got fractal power nodes, and these ancients discovered. And every single one of these points, even if it's in the ocean, you will find a structure, a megalithic structure or a pyramid on every single one of these points on our planet. And that's absolutely amazing. And that's science fact, not fiction. This is something that's being looked into right now by a lot of people. The, the, ones, the people that um, scour the oceans for wrecks and everything else are discovering everything. They just discovered pyramids off the coast of Florida inside the Bermuda Triangle, which I talk about on the new show that I'm on on the Travel Channel. It'll be coming out in a few months. Uh, there's pyramids everywhere. There's, if you draw a, a line from the Bermuda Triangle Pyramid straight through the Earth to the other side, you end up at the Dragon's Triangle where you have the Yagoni Pyramid, which is actually a tourist attraction. You can dive to it. There's a gigantic, and then guess what? They have the same exact mysterious disappearances as the pyramids they just found off the coast of Florida. Why? Because those pyramids are still generating a form of exotic energy. They just discovered that. One of the objects was taken from the pyramid complex out of Florida and taken to a laboratory, and it's emitting uh, some ionic, upward ionic field. And when you add, apply a magnetic field to that, anything you put above those ions levitates. And this is in real science, documented, real footage, actually documentary footage, which you'll get to see some of that pretty soon. Now let's go into a little bit about um, the ether of space-time itself and what is creative. Sylvester James Gates, Jr., he's an American theoretical physicist who works on supersymmetry, supergravity, and superstring theory. He retired from the physics department at the University of Maryland College of Computer mathematical and natural sciences in 2017, and he's now the Ford Foundation Professor of Physics at Brown University. He was the University of Maryland Regent, Regents Professor and served on former President Barack Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So the reason why I don't do this presentation and just speak myself for two hours or three hours, whatever I have the time, is because it's just me, Billy, the researcher. Even though I am going to graduate from MIT on, uh, on the 25th of this month with my SC in neuroscience, but, <laughs> thank you. But I'm, I like to provide these valid sources to you so that you can see it's not just me up here, some conspiracy guy who's been surfing Google and YouTube. I want you to understand that what I'm presenting to you is coming from very validated individuals. Let's hear what he has to say about the ether of space time, what he discovered. It's New York City, it's March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. <laughs> these are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. You're saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers. That is correct. So, the... wait, wait, I'm still, wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos. Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we can say are supersymmetric. Some of those codes are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes that in the description of our universe that is a supersymmetrical universe which we were going to test in the LHC if you believe that description I can show you the presence of these codes so I can't go through the whole you know the extra minutes there because we've got a little bit short of time but it's very important for you to understand that this is a <laughs> this is from a very credible source 
This guy leads the world in, in supersymmetry and supergravity. And what he's telling you is that the, the, the code that literally makes up what we consider to be our ether or our, our, our internal space here that we're dealing with in this universe in the third dimension can be broken down into computer codes, which means that it's very highly likely that we're living in a reality that it is a simulation. So it is a creation. The question is who created it, okay? It's New York some people City. call it God, some people call it the universe. <clears throat> Let's see what Hermes has to say as he gets into talking about some of the as above, so below. But Hermes Trism is Gestus, master of all arts and scientists, perfect in all crafts, ruler of the three worlds, scribe of the gods and keeper of the book of life. Both Hermes Trismegistus, the three times the greatest, the first intelligencer. He literally went around the planet teaching everybody, which is why I've been on a quest to go to all these ancient megalithic sites, because everywhere I go, I find evidence of Hermes, Thoth. Hermes is what they call him in Greek. Thoth is what they call him in the ancient Chem, before Egypt was even called Egypt. He ruled over Egypt 14,000 years himself. That's how long he ruled over Egypt, okay? And if, you th if that... Yeah, if that sounds amazing, you go into the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, and you discover the king's list, the Sumerian king's list. Some kings ruled for 28,800 years, 14,000 years, 7,800 years. That's a centerpiece at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, and you can go there and look, look at it yourself. These people were here, and they ruled over this planet. What's amazing and incredible is, just to get into bloodlines real quick, that Sumerian king's list bloodline uh, then became the pharaonic bloodline after the Great Flood. Uh, from there, after the Second Pyramid War, the pharaohs started migrating out after Alexander the Great conquered them, started migrating out of Egypt across Arabia, and over many years, and eventually ended up in England where they had kingship. So they started off mating and mating and mating and mating until they got to England where they don't look very Egyptian, the king and the queens of, of England, the, you know, but... If you go back down their bloodline, it goes right back to ancient Egypt, and again, it goes right back to Sumeria. Furthermore, the Plaginet line that came out of that kingship, matriarch and everything else out of England, turns out to be directly related to all of the presidents of the United States of America, including Donald Trump, including Obama, including Bush, even the people who didn't win, Dick Cheney. Um, they're, all, they're all cousins. They're all cousins and all direct bloodline relatives of the Plaginet bloodline, which can be traced back to the uh, monarchy, which can be traced back to the Arabian kings, which can be traced back to the Pharaonic kings, which can, then can be traced all the way back to ancient Samaria to Iraq. And that's a bone fact. You can look it up. You can do your own genealogical search and studies. Go to Jenny.com. Go to any of the genealogy sites and start tracing the bloodline to the mother's side and you will trace it all the way back. They're all related, they're all family. They only have two things, a couple of their puppets that they put on one side and a couple of the puppets they put on the other side. So no matter who wins, they win. And who's they? The elite families that run and control this planet. There's only 100 families running and controlling this planet, and that all bottlenecks down into the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay, that's, and guess who's also in that bloodline? Of course, Rockefeller, Hitler, they're all in the bloodline. This is very easy information to look up now, thanks to a lot of research that has been done. I did a whole show on the buzzsaw where I talked about this, but also about seven years ago, a 13-year-old girl discovered this in one of her science projects or school projects, and it went international news. And then real news teams started researching it, like, you know, those street beat researchers and everything, and said, oh, my God, this is actually true. And then Dick Cheney's wife came on TV and talked about the fact that she had written a book about the fact that Dick Cheney and Obama were were cousins and everything else. And then Bush got on TV and said, yeah, he's my cousin. And Obama said, yeah, he's my cousin. So this is not even a mystery to anybody. It's really a, no, a well-known fact. But it's just amazing something I wanted to bring out to you. Creation according to Hermes. In the beginning, Noah, which is also translates to God, created a second Noah who became a craftsman and creates the world. Noah too creates seven powers and seven spheres around what will become the earth. The seven spheres have control over what will, will, what will be the earth. They control what we know as destiny. The seven spheres are the moon, the sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Here is the beginning of astrology. Noah's two sets the spheres in motion. So this is literally um, an archetype of talking about creating a fractal pattern that can create all life in the entire universe. And this goes into the seven principles, which I'm not going to go into all seven principles. I'm going to mostly focus on the principle of correspondence, uh, which is number two. The principle of correspondence is as above, so below. We've all heard about this before. That gets into fractal patterning again, 
This is from 36,000-year-old text in the Emerald Tablets. Thoth is talking about uh, as above, so below, 36,000 years ago. And it goes into very uh, in-depth detail about it. And here is what we know as the seed of life. We see it all the time. We've got jewelry now. We've, you know, we put it on our websites and our screensavers and everything else. But these circles here uh, basically is where everything starts. And there's a, a group of cells at the base of your spine that are still in this format right now to this very day. Because once those first uh, eight cells, seven cells form uh, in this pattern, they stay at the base of the spine in all mammal, mammalian life until you die. This is a cross-cut section of DNA that has a flower of life and, and the golden ratio built directly into it. So no matter how small you go on the scale, you see a fractal again. The fractals are consistent throughout nature. And here we go again with uh, mitosis. Uh, you can see uh, just looking here as a cell develops how you can correlate it to the flower of life pattern. And the flower of life pattern itself is an energy pattern that emanates in us, around us, and through us, and it's, and it's everywhere, and it's omnipresent, which we're, going to, which, which we're going to see in a minute. And this pattern is literally what emanates and jingles frequencies that allow matters to jingle into existence in the third dimension. But it also can be broken into a, bio, a biological uh, method to where you can create life from it as well. It's everything. Everything is fractals. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, a brain cell versus the universe, the birth of a cell versus the death of a star, a human iris versus um, uh, the, the universe, so uh, a nebula. So you can see all these different uh, patterns throughout nature consistently, once again, in my personal opinion, proving that, that we're living in a fractal holographic universe. This pattern is burnt into uh, one of the pillars at the Osirian Temple, which I've been to, um, and I'm going back next year. Uh, which is I'm taking a, crew of, uh, taking a group of people with me. I'm going to actually be the tour guide this time in Egypt. Um, but this particular pattern is, is hermetically burned into this, uh, this column. It's like atomically fixed on this column. Now, Seem Haramain talks about it in a documentary. Um, I forget the name of the documentary now. You probably have seen it before. But he talks about this as well. One of the things he has seen and found to be very interesting, that it dates back tens of thousands of years. See, the Osirian Temple is partially buried uh, at Abydos, and above it is another temple. When you go to Egypt, you start to discover that there's sometimes four temples built on top of each other. The other temples are deep beneath the sand. You can't even see them anymore. There's some still that have not been excavated and probably never will be. This Osirian temple is only partially excavated and partially fills with water at different times of the year. Uh, at one point, it obviously wasn't completely submerged, and, uh, but they left a little calling card for us with this flower of life symbol depicting Taurus energy fields, uh, zero point energy and also creation of life. So you can see the same thing in the solar system. You can see that with, with the correlation to the inside of an atom versus our solar system. And just like how electrons can change orbits, uh, our planets can change orbits. The planets in our solar system have actually switched places before. So when an electron collides with another, an atom collides with another atom and the electron picks up a charge, it can jump orbits around its, uh, around its atom. It can actually change positions. And the same thing happens in our solar system when a very big spatial body passes through our solar system, which now science has proven mathematically that the Saturn and Uranus had switched places. And the reason why Uranus is on its side is because uh, of a gravity pull from another planet that came through here deep, deep antiquity, which is talked about in the uh, Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, again, which is a work of Sumerian tablets that was, pre that was uh, decoded and translated long before Zechariah Sitchin was even born. And also ta it's talked about in the, Atra, at the epic of the Atra Asis, or the Atra Asis epic, which is also translated uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, long before Zacharias Hitchin was born. Uh, so the reason why I always add that in is because you have the trolls that try to, you know, come in there. But, and I love Zacharias Hitchin's work, too, because I think he's one of the greatest researchers of all time. But, but these, um, it's talked about that this spatial body, this mass, came through our solar system, collided with some other planets, and rearranged the planets in our solar system. Cell division, uh, and you can see the effect that cymatic frequencies have on water droplets as well. And you can see a geometric pattern of the planet around the sun, that what it creates.
Did you like that song? Get it on iTunes. Forbidden Knowledge, that's my song. That's one of my songs. So um, that was a very short little video to demonstrate to you the practical patterning around the planet. And now I want to show you as above, so below one more time, and we're almost done here. But this is very important to understand how we go from the largest to the smallest and how you can also see yourself as part of the whole. This is you, basically, as you can see, the spermatozoa. You start out with the male energy, entering in the egg in the upper right. So eventually, somebody will win this battle. It's already been scientifically proven now that sperm even communicate with each other. That's another thing a lot of people know, that sperm communicate with each other. Uh, so they're alive. They're actual individual life forms. Once they break through here in the top right, that's when the spark of life happens. That's when your consciousness enters into your avatar body. At that moment is when your sync, your quantum entanglement happens from your higher dimension self and sinks in with this avatar body and puts you into what I call a temporal, not a temporary, but a temporal prison where your consciousness is encased here in the third dimension for a temporary amount of time. Uh, so that you can see in the lower left, the brain stem and the, uh, and the brain itself is just another further extension of the spermatozoa. It's not that it is the spermatozoa, it's that it's, it's a fractal pattern, as you can see. And then everything else you have around that stem and that brain is just there to keep the avatar alive. That's all. This is a meme I made a while ago. Hello, I am the universe, and it is a pleasure for you to meet yourself. Because we literally are all the universe, and the universe is us. And some of you guys know about Dr. Masuri Emoto and his scientific experiments. The guy is absolutely, and well, he was amazing, rest his soul now. Um, I got to go to a few lectures of his, uh, his number one assistant that he had, that he taught everything to, and going over frequencies. Like that song that I was playing a minute ago, that was written in 400, well, encoded at 432 hertz. And uh, he was really big on, on frequencies, as well as how thoughts affect water. And also, you can see the fractal patterning based off of positive frequencies and positive uh, thoughts on water, which I thought was really amazing. What is a hologram? So now we're going to go into talking about holograms, and we're going to put it all together. A three-dimensional image formed by the interference of light beams from a laser or other coherent light source. A photograph of an interference pattern that, when suitably illuminated, produces a three-dimensional image. And we're living in the third dimension. So when I look into that, the deeper I look into it, the more I start to feel that we're living in a projected light matrix. And what that means is every single atom that exists in this third dimension, I mean every single atom, is made of light. No matter how you break it down, I don't care if it's this table, this, this counter, this computer, this microphone, when you get into the, inside the atom and you split it open, you're gonna get energy, you're gonna get light. Everything actually exists as an electromagnetic wave until a conscious observer collapses it into what we consider to be digital matter. So, to me, at some point on the outer edges of the actual universe itself, all information is, is data, it's stored there permanently, but also there's a projection emanating inward, which we're gonna go into a little bit, that creates what we consider to be our reality. Now, we're living on the inside of this projected reality, which means we can't fully detect it, we're submerged and immersed inside of it. I'm gonna play Holograms about a couple of minutes of this and then we're gonna move on. They're those weird 3D ghost images that appear to follow you as you move but they're actually completely flat 2D films. And yet they have motion parallax. That is, as you move your gaze, things in the foreground seem to shift faster than things in the background. And they give you a stereoscopic view. That is, you see two different images with each eye, which together create the perception of depth. 3D movies aren't even this 3D. They don't even have motion parallax. And that hologram of Tupac at Coachella, it wasn't even three-dimensional in any way. I digress. So holograms need some really special properties to appear 3D. One is that they show different images depending on where you stand in front of the hologram. This is really unusual. Let's recall that when you look at a regular photograph, it looks the same no matter which way you look at it. 
What you're seeing when you look at the photo is a white light beam. White light is like a crowd of people. They're walking with different footstep lengths, like the different wavelengths or colors in white light, in every different direction as the light spreads out. That beam reflecting off the photo is like freeze framing the white light crowd. Blue light here, red light there, and it's stagnant. You can't move the crowd around. Blue parts will always be here to the left of those red parts. With a hologram, you can move. It provides that parallax effect. Check it out. This is the setup to make one type of hologram, although the other types are similar. It starts with a laser beam, which is split into two. Then both of the beams go through lenses to make them spread out. One beam, the object beam, bounces off the object you're trying to image and shines onto the holographic film, while the other beam, the reference beam, goes straight there. And then, well, this is why we used lasers. Laser light looks very different from white light. It's all going in the same direction, it all has the same wavelength, and it's coherent, meaning all the light waves are in phase, or in unison. This is so key to making holograms. In cases where two coherent laser beams meet, they can create regular striped interference patterns like this. In our case, the reference beam is a coherent beam, though the object beam is not. Still, when they meet, they also create an interference pattern, but a special one that encodes the specific 3D information about the object onto the holographic film. Now, we had a reference beam and an object beam and together they created an interference pattern. A plus B equals C. What would happen if we took the interference pattern and sent the reference beam in through the back? That's kind of like C minus A. Well, that equals B. And sure enough, with this type of hologram, sending a laser beam in through the back of the film is how you get out the original object beam. That's the same beam that was created when the laser first shined off the object. Since this reproduced beam is a perfect copy of the object beam, you can't tell whether you're looking at the light from the hologram or from the original scene. Compl Do you understand what she's saying? The universe has an outer edge and so from at some point outside of that edge, there's a beam of energy that's being sent in, that's giving us this parallax, that's giving us the ability to maneuver around this third dimension and see it as it is, as a realistic hologram that we think is true real life. But in reality, it's most likely a way of organizing light particles into what we consider and then housing, housing consciousness. So it's very interesting with motion parallax and stereoscopic views. The other cool thing about holograms is that all parts of the hologram carry information about the object. So you could cut a little square of the hologram and you'd still be able to see the entire object Fractals. in it. You can't do that with a photograph. Deep down though, the holographic film is just a bunch of interference patterns. Up close, the film looks like this whereas a photographic film just looks like a smaller version of the image. Much less cool. Oh, and the Tupac hologram? That was a stage trick called Pepper's Ghost that dates back as far as the 16th century. You could even create one at home. I'll link to some tutorials in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and if you liked it and want So you're starting to see that um, <laughs> the reality of it is that we're not, we're most likely not living in base reality. A lot of people have talked about this. Even Elon Musk has now come out and talked about it. A lot of other physicists have come out and talked about this, that base reality is most likely uh, multi-levels. And we're probably living in a universe that was created by somebody else or some other group of people. We could be living in an ancestor universe. We could be living in some child's uh, school experiment, a school project. I mean, think about it. We just saw at the beginning of this presentation a fractal program that is based off virtual reality. It had, I think it was almost, almost a Google of, of scenes in it, and it all fit on the space of one computer. Um, just think about it. Those guys made their own universe. Now, let's talk about this, and we're just about wrapped up. Eighth dimension quasi-crystals create a three-dimensional light matrix because I really believe that the energy that's creating or the shadow of the energy that's creating this third dimension is coming from what they call a quasi-crystal. Also has a pattern, but it isn't periodic. So, it's not a crystal. But there's a deep connection between the 2D object on the sand and the 3D mother crystal. 
This distorted 2D pattern is called a quasi-crystal. A quasi-crystal in a certain dimension, in this case 2D, is a projection of a crystal in a higher dimension, in this case 3D. A group of physicists in Los Angeles is working on a new physics theory where a particular 8D crystal, yep, that's right, an eight-dimensional crystal, is projected to 4D at a very particular angle, which forms a 4D quasi-crystal. And from this 4D quasi-crystal, they derive a 3D quasi-crystal, which they believe is the fundamental substructure of all of reality. So we ourselves are now creating our own universes consistently. This is something that's going on everywhere. CERN, at universities all around the world, at uh, different scientific facilities and research facilities. We are deeply involved in creating universes and black holes. This is something that we're, we're doing right now. We meaning the people in those positions that are working on these particular experiments and projects. We now have, uh, as you know, The Sims, uh, which also is a video a game that, um, that people can play. And this video game uh, is going to be conscious. They're saying within an, at first it was going to be within 20 years. Now it's going to be much sooner than that. Probably within eight years, The Sims are going to be conscious. This is a quick clip from The Sims, and I'm going to wrap up. But you must understand what's going to happen when these people in this video game want to find out who their creators are, who was their god, where did they come from, and where their Big Bang came from. AI technology is making them conscious. Say, that seems unrealistic, but when you're talking about multidimensional beings, elementals, and these types of things, we're talking about people that are living in other dimensions that have the capability, these sims have must have found a way to phase shift their atomic frequency, because if you phase shift your atomic frequency, you can literally pass from one dimension into the next. All you have to do, to re all that's required to pass into another dimension, is you must match the frequency of that dimension, period. There's no other way, there's no other reason. Uh, that's included as well for wormhole travel. You see the, uh, some of the jet pillar onks that the ancient pharaohs would hold in their hand. Each one of those jet pillar onks were tied to a specific frequency of, the, of, that, of that pharaoh's body, which allowed him to walk through some of the portal technology. You had to match. If it doesn't match, you cannot. I get that information directly off of crystal stones that were left at the Bosnian pyramid that talk about that. But these particular, in this particular animation, is obviously a little facetious, but they must have broken out of their matrix. And the only thing that stops my hand from going through this podium is not that I can't pass it through this podium because atoms are 99.9% .9 empty space. You never really touch anything. It's the repulsion of the electromagnetic energy in my hand, the, the electrons in my hand are repelling, repelling the ones in this podium. But if I was able to phase shift my atomic frequency of, my, of, the, of the atoms in my hand to match this podium, I'd pass my hand right through it and bring it right back with no problem. So when you hear of people walking through walls and all these types of things, it's very realistic. I put everything back to real science, real physics, things that could be done in a real scientific way with scientific thought. And in my personal opinion, it doesn't take away from the spirituality. What it does to me, it enhances it because now I'm understanding the underworkings of how this stuff is operating, not just thinking it's some kind of weird magic. Hey guys, for a bit of knowledge here. This is it, and then the last one is my final statement. Hey guys, for a bit of knowledge here, I want to talk to you real quick about the Vesica Pisces and the womb of creation. A circle actually has two points, point A and point B. These two single points are actually clones of one another, and those two points have equal potential. 
because point A can rotate around point B and point B can rotate around point A. This is one radius that both circles share. The black form in the middle is called the Vesica Pisces. You are literally looking at the womb of the universe. Every single thing that exists emanates from the Vesica Pisces. I mean all. All of the vibratory frequencies that create a material world actually emanate from this womb. The energy from the matrix is feminine by nature. The ancients called it the Sophia energy. They already knew the universal energy was actually feminine. Forbidden That's knowledge, signing off. Did you like that song, by the way? <laughs> iTunes, Forbidden Knowledge, look it up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, hey, gotta have a shameful plug, you know. But has anybody here been to Cairo before? Cairo, Egypt? Okay, you've been there? Man, it looks horrible. Jeez. I'm not talking about the pyramids, I'm talking about where, where the people live. When I, the first time I got there, I said, wow, have we fallen. We have really fallen. Um, the building structures, the dirt all over the street, there's no color. Everything is one color. This braids brick brown. And it's not because that's what it has to be, because of the sun and everything. No, it's because there's no feminine energy there. Women are completely and fully oppressed in Egypt, in a lot of the Ara Arabic countries. And so what you're seeing with all the filth and the dirt and the, and the front part of the Nile backed up with, with tons of garbage and now piles of garbage on Giza. They're using Giza as a dumping ground right behind the Great Pyramids. I, was, I almost cried. I, I'm not going to lie. It was, it was that bad. Um, but this is, again, evidence of no feminine input. When I went to one of the stores to buy some oils, the, the, the woman at the, at the um, cashier's uh, thing was looking down and, you know, taking my money. She couldn't even look at me in the face. So you're looking at the evidence there of that city, of that area, that country. You're looking at the evidence of no feminine input whatsoever. You're seeing all masculine energy, and you see what it looks like. It looks like a giant bachelor's pad. <laughs> it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible. So when you take away, you know, the, and the reason why I brought this up is because the, the feminine energies have been oppressed in the third dimension, uh, going back into ancient times, um, and all the way up until now. It's still not being fully realized but you must have the balance. And when you don't have the balance, look at the state of the world today. Look at the state of the world today. So what I'm saying is you have to have that balance and, and that's part of the energy that creates up the universe. My final statement here, we are living in the matrix. We are living in a holographic matrix. Thought, which is I am, materializes reality on this planet as a vibrating light or a hologram. It is brought in, in through electromagnetic frequency, and vi which is vibration and sound. Thus, we, what we see or think of as solidity is actually a hologram created through thought, light, and sound. Everything in this material world is here because our higher light frequency self has called them into being. Just like a video game when the next frame of graphic appears on the, on the, as the characters need them to. We are a collective consciousness of everything created. Our particles instantaneously communicate with one another regardless of distance, whether we are 10 feet or 10 billion miles apart. Somehow each particle always seems to know what the other particle is doing, and all information is possessed by the whole and although we think we are separate from this whole, we are not. Separation is an illusion. This whole or all that is cannot be separated. We are the Sims, as we just saw. We are a part of this fractal of light that makes up this entire third dimension and this holographic universe. Your consciousness wave function collapses electromagnetic energy into quantified digital bits of information that we call matter. And that's it, guys. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>